Hey everybody, so glad that you're joining in today. And again, I just wanna thank you for your support, for your continued giving. And a reminder that you can give easily online, you can give on the church app, you can mail in a check. And also, we are open in two services. We would love to have you here. If you feel comfortable enough to come back and you're in the area, we would really, really encourage you to come back. David said that I was glad when they said unto me, let me go to the house of the Lord. And that verse has become so real to me this year in the times that we have not been able to, to meet in God's house. It is amazing to be together again in God's house. And now here are a few announcements and Elaine Medina will be reading scripture for us. Hey everybody, we are so excited to announce Where's Owen? Let's go find him. Oh, hey, Pastor Angie. Owen, where have you been? I've just been so busy. I'm trying to get ready for youth camp. And I got my blanket, I got my uke, and I got my Bible. And I got my tent. Perfect, right? Owen, it's not that kind of camp. We're going to Old Oak Ranch. We're gonna be going up to Old Oak Ranch July 22nd through the 25th. So be sure to get your permission slip signed and turned in. Hey everyone, it's your favorite pastor here to tell you about Monday the 24th. We're gonna be talking in our marriage class about how to bulletproof your marriage. There's so many things that we can do that strengthen our marriage, strengthen any relationship. And I also want to tell you that on Monday, June 7th, that is the Monday following Memorial Day, Monday, June 7th at 6 o'clock, we're going to be having a barbecue outside for everyone. You're all welcome to come. We're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs, some sodas and chips. After the barbecue at 7 o'clock, we're going to come in and we're gonna do our wrap up for the relationship series, Pathway to Peace. And we're gonna talk about the main reasons why, why relationships fail and what we can do to make them stronger. Everyone's welcome, even if you haven't come to the classes. This one class kinda sums them all up. June 7th at six o'clock barbecue, seven o'clock class. God bless you, have a great day. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. because we have another one coming up on Saturday, June 12th. You can register by scanning the QR code at the check-in counter. And if you are looking to volunteer, check out our website and click the volunteer registration link and sign up to volunteer. And you can get one of these awesome shirts. Good morning, church. <laughs> Today's scripture is Matthew 3, 11 through 15. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Matthew 3, 11 through 15. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. As always, that was awesome. And now, here's Pastor Mark with John the Baptist, part two. 
Hello, and thanks for joining us today at the Foothills Church. Uh, we've got a good message today on John the Baptist. You know, last week we talked about how we all need a John the Baptist, someone who will help us find our way back to the Lord. And then we need to be a John the Baptist, helping others find their way back to God. That's what we're here for. We're here to worship God. We're here to serve God. And we're here to spread the message, uh, the good news of who Jesus is in our life. And so uh, today we're going to look at the words of John the Baptist and not just that we need a John the Baptist and we need to be a John the Baptist, but we need to heed the words of John the Baptist. And so before we get into this message, could you bow your head with me and let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, what a great day. We thank you, God, again for another wonderful day to be in your presence, to be in your house, even though some are not in your house physically we're in your house. You're with us in our house. And so, Father, I just pray for an anointing on today's message. We pray that you bless this day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So, John the Baptist. What are the words of John the Baptist? Uh, this is something that John the Baptist said in regards to uh, Jesus and his encounter with Jesus. But we have to know we are empty. We have to know we are empty. And so John the Baptist, who began his ministry about three months before Jesus did, was baptizing all around the Judean countryside in the Jordan River, uh, wherever it was flowing. John was there. Crowds were coming out to see him. He was preaching and teaching, come back to the Lord, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And he was baptizing people in the Jordan River. Well, Pharisees came out and said, who are you and who gave you the authority to do this? And so here's what John said. I baptize you with water for repentance. But, but after me will come one who's more powerful. He's talking about Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Well, let's look for just a minute at these words. I baptize you with water for repentance. The baptism for repentance that John was preaching and teaching is an admission of a need for a change. He was, he was trying to draw people out of their everyday, ordinary lives and say, you need to change your life. You need to prepare your heart because Jesus is coming. Very same thing we're to be doing right now. We are to be preaching the gospel that Jesus is coming so that people understand this need to change their life. Their need for a savior. And it's what we must go through, this baptism of repentance. Now, I'm not necessarily right now talking about physical water baptism, though that's what John was doing. But baptism is this idea of, of recognizing I need to change. And that's, well, that's repentance and then baptism together. And that we need to change and we need a savior. We need Jesus. Baptism, the word, literally means to be immersed or overwhelmed. That's a secondary definition of baptism, to be overwhelmed. Now, in a physical sense, it's to be overwhelmed by water or to be immersed in water. But in a spiritual sense, it means to be immersed with guilt or overwhelmed, convicted by guilt. Guilt over what? Our sin. Now, the word repent, and I put this word metanoia in parentheses, that's the literal Greek definition or word for repent. And meta means to change. Noia means you're thinking. So it means to change or turn our mind. Our mind thinks one way about something, but to repent, metanoia means to, to stop and say, wait a minute, the way I'm thinking about life, the way I'm thinking about my actions, the way I'm thinking about my afterlife is, is wrong. I need to turn and go the other direction. I need to change my thinking. It's to reconsider our ways. That's what repent means. It also means to perceive differently about life, as I said earlier, or just a second ago, and the afterlife. People need to think about the afterlife because you know what? Death is the destiny of every man and the living take it to heart. That's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Death is the destiny of every man and the living take it to heart. Arnold Tonaby, who was a, a, a philosopher, he said this, that man is the only animal with the foreknowledge that one day he will die. And so, if you're thinking that when you die it's over and you're going to be put in the ground and, and push up daisies, you're wrong. 
There is an afterlife. There is an eternity. And to repent means you start to say, hey, the way I'm thinking about the afterlife is wrong. I need to prepare for the afterlife. And so until we're immersed in our sins, we'll not be overwhelmed by them. And that's important. On May 11, 1981, I went forward at a, at a uh, church in Grand Junction, Colorado, New Horizons Foursquare Church. I was immersed in my sin and overwhelmed by them. And this question came out. Jesus saved me. Or not this question, but this statement. And then the question, what do I do? I need help, right? Because you're overwhelmed. But people that are never immersed in their sin or overwhelmed by them never know how, how empty they are of God. Now, it's not our job to point everyone's sin out. That's not what we're saying. I think you can just talk to people about the love of God and the good of, goodness of God and the grace of God, and, and they start to learn that, hey, I'm not those things, and I don't have those in my life. Why? My sin. We need to know how empty we are of God, and we need to see our need to be rescued. That's what we need. I need to be rescued. And I didn't just need to be rescued on May 11th, 1981. I need to be rescued every day. Every day I need to repent of my sins and ask Jesus to forgive me. So I'm not just talking to people that don't know Jesus right now. And if you don't know Jesus right now, you can right now. You're just an ask away. You're just a, Lord, I want to talk to you. Can we talk? I love what God says in Isaiah chapter 118. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, I'll make them white as wool. God wants to cleanse us. He wants to purify us. He wants to make us clean of our sin. But we have to realize, and this is what the baptism of repentance is about. We have to realize our need, our need. Overwhelmed by guilt, our need for a savior, our need to be rescued. And so in Luke chapter three, verse 10, as John the Baptist was preaching, here's what people said. What should we do then? What a great question. What a great question. Most everyone I know that have made a significant change in their life because of Jesus Christ, when they confessed their sins to the Lord and came to Christ, some form of this question was raised to God. What do I do now? What do I do now? Not just, hey, thanks, Jesus, for saving me, and then you go about your life. That's how, that's how some people get saved. They just ask Jesus in their heart and say, okay, got that taken care of. I'm not going to hell now. I'm going to heaven. And they just mosey on through their, their existence doing what they did before. But there are some people when they, get, when they get saved and they repent, they ask Jesus. And I think this is a sign of repentance. What do I do now? Help me. Help me to be different. See, there were three groups of people. The common people. And there were a lot of common people in Jesus' day. Just the common people, the everyday folk. Tax collectors. And there was a number of them. Tax collectors made a lot of money. That was a, a great way for a Jewish man to earn money, though they weren't very well liked because they were all betrayers of their people. They were turncoats for the Romans. And then there were Roman soldiers. You know, there were Roman soldiers that were milling about Jerusalem and, and the Judean countryside all the time because they were the occupying force. And so they were there. They were listening to the messages. And they all asked John this same question. What should we do? It's a great question. What should we do? This shows, this is the desire to repent, to change. Metanoia. The way we're thinking about life, the way we're living our life needs to change. I need to be immersed in God. That's this baptism of repentance that John was talking about. Now, it's interestingly enough, the Pharisees, they didn't ask. Their question was, who gave you the authority to do this? There's a lot of people following you and we don't like it. They're not following us. They're changing and they're desiring to be changed and we don't have anything to do with it. So, John... Really, you need to stop. And John's like, yeah, I'm not going to. They didn't ask. You know, maybe, maybe the Pharisees didn't think they were sinners. 
a lot of religious people in our, in our world, there's a lot of religious people in our country that don't believe they're really sinners. They're okay. Well, I do this and I do this and I do this and I do this. So therefore, I'm a good person. You're a good person? According to whose standards? There's a lot of people that just don't think they're sinners. Now, there were three, three groups that were listening to John and saying, what do we do? There were two groups of people that, that won't repent. The three that were listening, the three groups, the common people, the tax collectors, and the Roman soldiers, what do we do? But there's two groups of people that are alive today in the United States of America and across the world who won't repent. The first group are those who falsely believe they're good enough. We hear this all the time. The moralist, I'm a good person. Why do I need to change? I pay my taxes. I keep my yard nice. I take care of my kids and I work hard and I, you know, I give a couple bucks here and there to people. I saw a homeless person and I gave him five dollars. I'm a good person. Well, being a good person is really not the point. Having Jesus in your heart, confessing your sins. Because no matter how good a person thinks they are, they've sinned. We know this. But people that think they're good enough are never going to repent. Well, I don't want to say never because you never know. But they won't repent. And those who don't believe, maybe they know that they sinned, but they don't have to report to anybody. So why repent if I don't have to report? Well, listen, we do have to report to somebody. But there's people in, in America now and, and in North America and across the world that I don't have to report to some God just because you say I do. Preacher, who are you to tell me what I need to do? Well, I don't have to tell you anything. The Word of God says it clearly. Well, I don't, I don't believe in the Word of God. And that's your choice. See, but those who do repent, here's what they know. They know they're wrong. Even if you serve the Lord for 20 years, 40 years, like I have 40 years, I know that I still do wrong. And then I still have stinking thinking about things. I'm still wrong in the way I look at things and need to repent. I need, I, I need my mind to turn, to change. I have, I have to have this desire to be immersed with guilt, so I convicted, and so I confess my sins daily. Sometimes, sad to say, several times a day. Isn't that sad? So people that repent know they're wrong, and they know that there's a God they'll report to, that there is somebody who I will give an account to. It's important. And then that only he can save them. Some people may believe they're wrong and that they're going to report to a God. This is the religious now. Okay, this is, this is the definition of religion. I am a sinner. I am going to report to God or the church. And so I have to do things to get saved. I have to do things to be accepted. And so they go through all these religious rites and rituals in order to say, see, I took care of my sins myself. That's not real repentance because you are the author of your salvation. God is the author of salvation. Peter said that salvation is found in no one else. Peter said this. Salvation is found in no one else. Acts chapter 4. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. You can't save yourself. So, you know you're wrong. You're going to report to God and only he can save you. Speaking of Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, he said these words. Now, Peter was preaching to a, a large group of people. This was 50 days after the ascension of Jesus into heaven on Pentecost. 50. Penta. And Peter was preaching, he says, when the people heard this, as he was preaching about Jesus Christ and how he died on the cross for them and that they put him on the cross, the people were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? There's that definition of repentance again. What shall we do? The same things they were asking John. 
What do we do then? Repent. Come back to Jesus. Get your heart and your life right with him again. That's what we do. So we have to know that we're empty. What do I do? I need help if we're going to be filled. And that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to fill us with his grace. He wants to fill us with his mercy. He wants to fill us with his life, with his power, with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus comes to John the Baptist. John's baptizing people in the Jordan. And Jesus comes to John to be baptized. And John, oh, John knew. John, he recognized who Jesus was. And he says to Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. I need to be, I need to be baptized by you. I need to be immersed and overwhelmed by you. You don't need to be baptized for sin. You don't need to change. We need to change to you. See, most people seek God for what he can do for them. Many people. Many people seek God for what he can do for them. Now, if that's why a person comes to the Lord, okay. Any, by any means, if you come to the Lord for any means, for any reason whatsoever, I'm for it. I'm with you. I'll help you. But that's not it. That's not all there is, is what Jesus can do for them. Because some people, they just want God to give them a new this or a new that, or a better this or a better that. I need a better car or a better house, a better job, a better whatever. And so they're coming to God for this and that. And that's, I mean, that's okay. God does love us. I mean, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. David said in Psalms 55, 22, cast your burdens on the Lord for he cares for you. In Psalm 69, David wrote, or Psalm 68, verse 19, I believe it is, God says he daily bears our burdens. So God cares about every facet and detail of your life. But that's not the only reason we come to him is for a better this or a new that. See, in other words, there's some people that they just want Jesus to immerse himself in their affairs. Jesus, will you come and help me with this? Oh, Jesus, I have a test this week. I haven't studied, but God, help me with this. Well, yeah, God cares about your test. He cares about your presentation at work. He cares about all the things in our life. But he didn't come to be immersed in our affairs. That's not why he came. He came that we would be immersed in him. And John got it, didn't he? And then people say, you know, hey, while you're at it, Jesus, bring your power and your blessings. That's what I need, Lord. I need your power and your blessings for what I want. And that's just the self-centeredness of many people that come to Christ. But if it brings you to Christ, praise God, because the Holy Spirit will start working on its self-centeredness. That you really don't come to Christ for what he can do for you. You really come to Christ for who he is in you. John got it. No, no, no. I need to be baptized by you. I need, I need you. You don't need me to baptize you. I need you. He pursued Jesus for who he was, not what he could do. That was the heart. That's why I want to be like John the Baptist. I needed a John the Baptist to find Jesus, and now I want to be a John the Baptist to help people find Jesus. But I want to be like John the Baptist as well. I want to pursue Jesus. I want to be immersed in Jesus, not the other way around. John got it. John wanted Jesus to fill him to overflowing, to be immersed in him. Jesus, fill our hearts. Jesus, fill our lives. I, I, don't, I don't need a new car. I don't need a new home. I don't need a new this, a new that. I need you. Jesus, I need you to fill my mind and to change my thinking, to fill my heart and to change my desires. Lord, I need you. You know, in John 13, 8, I'm kind of switching gears here, but it's the same kind of an idea. Okay, so follow along with me. Jesus is... Is this is this is this is the night before Jesus is arrested, and 
they were having the Last Supper and nobody had, pre had prepared to have their feet washed. But they all needed their feet washed because their feet were dirty. <laughs> Why did Jesus wash the disciples' feet? Because their feet were dirty. And so Jesus took off his outer robe and he wrapped a towel around his waist like a servant. And he took a bowl of water and he, and, he, and he got down on his knees and he started to wash the disciples' feet. Wow. I wonder how many of those disciples said, um, we should be washing his feet. We should be washing. He's the teacher. He's the Messiah. They've already declared him as the Son of God. They all believe at this point that Jesus is the Messiah. And yet he's washing their feet. And he comes to Peter and Peter says, no. No, you, you, you shall never wash my feet. Oh, that was awful proud of you, Peter. <laughs> Jesus says this, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. See, John, I, I need to be baptized by you. I need to be immersed in you. I'm the one that needs to change. Peter's like, oh, no, 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 you're not going to, no, you're not going to do that for me. And Jesus said, if I don't, you're in trouble. If I don't wash you, you're in peril. See, in a sense, both John and Peter tried to tell the Lord no. They both said, in a sense, no. It's just John's was different. John's came from a different heart, a different mentality, a different mindset, one that was changed. Peter's mindset had yet to change. We know that because at the garden, Peter's the one that drew a sword and cut off a guy's ear. Okay, that doesn't sound like a guy that's really been impacted that much by Jesus at this point. It was also Peter who, when a couple, when a servant girl said, hey, aren't you one of his folks? I don't even know who you're talking about. Jesus who? So Peter obviously had some stuff that still needed to be worked out. John got it. John got it. But hey, not to be too hard on Peter. Don't we all have stuff that needs to be worked out? Haven't I denied him in areas like Peter denied him? Yes, I have. Say, how can you deny him as a pastor? Oh, spend a few days with me. You'll see. We all have sinned. And we all continue to struggle with sin and, and struggle with life. It's just the nature of us. But John had a different perspective. John knew he needed to be cleansed by Jesus. I need to be immersed. I need to be overwhelmed. I need to be overflowing with you, not the other way around. Peter, oh, no, 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 no. I don't need you to wash me. See, Peter had yet to realize how dirty from sin he was. Uh, not in a negative way. I, I don't want you to feel like I'm picking on you or anything, but we all need to realize how dirty from sin we are and that we're going to report to God for it. Paul said in Romans 14 that we're all going to give an account of ourselves to God. But listen, if we just ended it there, you see, you're stuck with religion or ignoring. You just ignore your sin or you turn to religion to fix yourself. I don't want to leave you there. There's hope. There's an answer. His name's Jesus. He came and he died for us, shedding his blood so that we could all be cleansed. I love what John says in 1 John 1, 9. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Why does he tell us he's faithful and just? Because we've been unfaithful and unjust. But he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. There's the answer. Peter had yet to realize how dirty he was from sin. But oh, let me tell you something about Peter. After he betrayed Jesus, the Bible says he went outside and wept bitterly. You know what that means? Peter was overwhelmed with guilt over what he had done. There was repentance that happened right there. I believe that because of the, the overwhelming sense that he felt from his sin of denying Jesus, whom he did love. He did love Jesus. We must see our dirt in order to repent. And I know some of you have been serving Jesus a long time. I know some of you grew up in the church. We need to see our dirt in order to repent. We need 
We need to confess our sins. And if you've never asked Jesus in your heart, that's what you do. You ask Jesus to come into your heart. You ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You ask Jesus to, to fill you with his goodness and his love and his mercy. And then if you're serious, the next thing you say is, all right, what do I do now, Lord? What do I do now? You get involved in a church, prayerfully, hopefully the foothills. You surround yourself with godly believers, with godly people that love God, that love you. You read his word, his love letter to you. You pray, you talk to God about everything in your life and you continue to seek and pursue him for who he is in your life, not just what he can do. That's salvation. And that's something that's available for every, every human being. Every one of you that's listening right now, salvation is available for you, but you gotta ask, confess, and then say, Lord, what do I do now? And then you do that. And you're going to fall at times, but there'll be people like me, like others who will help you get up because we've all fallen too. We know what it's like to fall. We've got skin knees as well. I want you to bow your heads and I want to pray with you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for everyone that is listening today. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that, that a, a sense of repentance would come over our church. A sense of of, of a desire to follow you and pursue you. Blessed are those who pursue your kingdom, who pursue your righteousness, who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Jesus, you say we'll be blessed if we hunger and thirst after righteousness. So God, I just pray for a, that, that Holy Spirit, that you would convict us of our sin and change us. Not that we feel bad, but that we feel our need for you and come to you in openness and honesty and transparency. I love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening today. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about John the Baptist and some of his great words of wisdom for us. Have a terrific day. Thank you. <laughs>